Welcome to your first anatomy and physiology module. And this is called the structure of the human body. So we're not going to talk about the individual organs within this, that will be in the subsequent modules. But here we're just going to give an overview of the structure itself, the cells that we're made up of, the tissues that are contained within us, and also how we refer to the human body in terms of manual therapy. So there are levels of organisation within the body. We start with chemical. So the body consists of many chemicals, for example, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, protein, enzymes. But all of these chemicals are arranged into a number of cells. So it's like a hierarchy. Cells made up of chemicals. And these are arranged into a variety of different structures. So a cell is the smallest or most fundamental living part of the body. Tissues, this is a collection of cells, but a collection of cells with a common function. And that's what differentiates the different types of tissues. For example, a group of cells that contract when grouped together for muscle tissue. An organ, you've guessed it, is a group of tissues. But when that group of tissues group together, produce a function. This is called an organ. So, for example, the hard heart is made up of several types of tissues, but that all work together to create the function of the heart. A system is a group of organs that work together to perform a process or function. For example, the digestive system. It's not just made of the stomach, it's also made of the mouth, the esophagus, and on and on. Like in the last example with the heart, the heart is made up of several types of tissue, but the heart itself is not a system. The heart, along with all of the veins, arteries, capillaries, it's these groups of organs that work together to create a process or function. That is called a system. So hierarchy from chemical, through to system. Let's take a deep dive into the anatomy of the cell and let's start with the outermost layer here, the cell membrane, okay, which contains most of the genetic material for the cell. It is a thin protective layer that separates the cell from the interstitial fluid and protects those inner workings of the cell. It is amazing because this membrane is also the entry and exit point for the cell. Nutrients can be absorbed in from the interstitial fluid, but also waste products, proteins can be released out. So it's an exit point from the cell into the fluid for circulation in the body as well. Now let's go to the very center, the nucleus, which we can see here. The nucleus can be seen as the control center of the cell. It contains all the information within DNA, within that cell, all of that information needed for the cell to function and to control all the operations provided by the cell. So what is the differentiator between the different cells of the body? Within the nucleus, we have this smaller area, which is the nucleolus. And this separates the interior of all of the cells from the outside environment to make ribosomes. It's the densest part of the nucleus. These ribosomes contain the amino acids needed to build proteins. Let's talk about vacuoles. So they store the food or nutrients required by the cell along with the cellular waste products. So again, that's a center for those entry and exit points. So bringing the nutrients in, but also storing cellular waste products until they're excreted or secreted. We then have the centrosome. The centrosome is responsible for regulating the cell cycle for cellular division. It's located close to the nucleus and contain protein fibers and centrioles, which we can see here. Next up, we're going to talk about the Golgi apparatus. 
This modifies, sorts and packages the proteins for secretions. So I always think of this one like the postal office, getting all the sorting ready before things exit and enter. Mitochondria. This is a really important one. This is responsible for the energy within the cell, for energy conversion and the production of ATP. And something we'll talk about a lot when we talk about how energy is created, for example, in muscles for movement. Mitochondria. We then have lysosomes. This is for digestion. So material taken up from outside the cell or obsolete components of the cell itself. Vesicles. These are used for the transportation of material into or out of within the cell fluid that fills a cell. This cell fluid. The cytoplasm, the cytoplasm is the fluid that fills a cell. And then we have the endoplasmic reticulum. This provides a surface area for chemical reactions. So a number of chemical reactions happen within the cell and it's upon this surface, the endoplasmic reticulum, that these take place. It's made up of a network of intracellular membranes or these tube-like sacs that you can see here. They contain the enzymes needed for protein and lipid synthesis, for example. They contain the products needed for those chemical reactions. So you could see this as the factory for producing, processing and sorting the chemicals needed for the cells and their chemical reactions. For example, calcium would be stored in the need for muscle contraction in muscle cells. So the tissues of the body are groups of cells that function together. The epithelial tissue, so let's look at the first one here in pink. So these are closely packed cells arranged in one or more layers. And in terms of structure, those layers of cells are to provide a protective function. That's why they tend to be in layers to give strength. Tissues that cover the surfaces that are exposed to the environment or line the inside of passages, the chambers and the organs within the body tend to be made from epithelial tissue and also glands. So the skin is a good example or the lining of the tubes of the respiratory system. They also protect the body from the external environment, from injury, so they tend to be strong and also from the invasion of foreign agents like bacteria. Nervous tissue. This consists of cells that can receive and facilitate nerve impulses or send those impulses across their membranes to the next cell or neuron as part of the nervous system. The brain, spinal cords and all the nerves themselves are made up of nervous tissue. They are able to initiate or conduct nerve impulses. So although we touch the epithelial tissue of the skin, our view is to stimulate those nerves and to communicate with a client's nervous system. So again, these systems are integrated. They do not work alone. The muscular system or the muscular tissue. These are tissues that consist of elongated cells that possess the ability to contract and relax, creating movement. There are three types of muscle tissue smooth, skeletal and cardiac that we'll look at in detail in the muscular anatomy section. Muscle tissue can be controlled both consciously and unconsciously, so autonomic as well as somatic control from the nervous system. Connective tissue, again one we're very concerned with as manual therapists. So this connective tissue is the most abundant tissue in the body. There was a time it was thought to simply connect, but what we know now is that it has a far greater function than that. It is more innervated than muscles and communicates quickly and reactively with the nervous system. 
It forms a continuous network in the body, connecting and going through all organs and systems, even through bone. It gives the body shape, a framework within everything sits to function. It is made up of protein fibers, for example, elastin, collagen and reticular, as well as water. Its function is to bind structures together and help them work together, that integrative function of all of these systems. It is believed that the fascia helps to connect those, not just physically, but on a neural level as well. It provides support, protection, fills spaces and helps store fat. Membranes. So membranes line the interior of various bodily structures. For example, the cell membrane that we talked about. It is made up of a combination of epithelial tissue and connective tissue. And there are four types, sometimes argued five in the body. Serous, mucous, synovial and cutaneous. Mucous membranes line the interior walls of the tubes that are open to the outside of the body to protect them. Serous membranes cover organs and line the body cavities. Synovial membranes are found within those freely movable joint cavities and we'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about joints. Cutaneous membrane describes the skin itself and then also the meninges cover the brain and spinal cord. There are a number of other types of tissue in the body that we'll touch on briefly. Glandular tissue and lymphoid tissue. Glandular tissue consists of epithelial tissue. It's a sub-branch within that. Glands secrete bodily products like hormones, oils and sweat. Lymphoid tissue, tissue is, makes up a number of different types of structure within the body and their common function is that they are to fight infection. Bone marrow, white blood cells, lymphocytes, the thymus, spleen, the lymph nodes. What they all have in common is that immune ability. They form the immune system and help protect the body against infection and foreign bodies. Homeostasis. This is an important phrase. It is also something that we help our clients to try and achieve when we do manual therapy. It is the job of the body to provide a constant cell environment. Homeostasis is how you would describe this constant internal environment within the body, this balance that the body tries to achieve. It's where all of the systems work constantly together to monitor and maintain this homeostasis or balance by regulating the internal environment. Monitoring levels of hormones are more needed, is less needed. How those hormones interact with various systems of the body, for example. It is this constant process where the body at such detail levels across so many cells, tissues, organs and systems monitors where we're at, where we need to be, and tries to make the changes needed to keep us in this homeostasis. So now we're going to talk a little bit about planes and structure in the body. So this one is more about how we name nomenclature for how we name the structures within the body and how we talk about the different planes within the body. And this is really useful for describing where we're working on a client, what we find and how we communicate with other professionals. So there are three planes we talk about in the body. The coronal plane, which is this plane that goes across the body, splitting it into front and back. We then have the sagittal plane, as you can see here, which is that side on view, which splits us in two. Then we have the transverse plane, which splits us from top to bottom. Anatomical positioning. This is really useful, one in describing where, for example, something is an area of tension in the body, but will also help you with learning things like muscle names and bone names. We talk about superior being above, inferior being below, and that brings us to distal and proximal. So proximal 
is closest to the midline of the body and distal to the midline of the body. And this is important when we talk about things like muscular attachments. What's the proximal attachment? Also called the origin. What's the distal attachment or the insertion? We then have lateral and medial. Medial towards the midline, lateral away. Useful terms in terms of movement, so lateral rotation, so rotation away from the body versus medial rotation, for example. And also we talk about medial lateral in terms of aspects of a bone. Which side of a bone is medial? Which side is lateral? Medial towards midline, lateral away. Right and left, no explanation needed. We then have the dorsal, so the posterior or dorsal aspects of the body or the back of a bone, for example, the posterior or dorsal aspect. And then the opposing is anterior or the ventral. So the front, anterior or ventral. Then in terms of the spine, we have cranial towards cranium or caudal. So again, having this understanding of those terms will help it make sense when you start looking at the names of the various bones and the various muscles. Quadrants. So we often talk about the quadrants when we're working in the abdominal area. We've got the right upper quadrant. For example, you might find the liver here. The left upper quadrant. Left lower quadrant and the right lower quadrant. Again, you may have clients who have various surgeries, various issues, and when you're reading medical reports, it is good to understand what these terms refer, um, refer to and where you may find scarring, for example. You may not be working on a client's abdomen, but they may tell you that they've had a hernia on the right lower quadrant, for example. So understanding where that is will help you understand how that potential surgical removal of a hernia or fixing of the hernia might have an impact on your client's movement. So again, it just helps you be more precise with locating on the body. So what does it mean for massage? It's quite a technical one, this one, and the structure of the body. It's the first A&P module, but it really sets the scene for each of the systems that we're going to go through subsequently. Manual techniques are applied to the human body through massage, through the skin primarily, but it has a knock-on impact on many systems. So it's important that you understand how the body is made up of these systems, tissues and cells. And although we touch one system, the skin, how that can have a knock-on impact to the cells right across the body. We impact not just the skin we touch, but the nervous system, which controls the muscles, the organs of the body. We also impact local blood flow and lymph. The connective tissue means that our touch of the skin can have a knock-on impact on connective tissue that flows right through bone. It can lead to changes across the whole body. As homeostasis implies, the impact on one part of the body can have an impact on many systems of the body. And that is why when we work with massage, it's important that we need to understand what's going on across the body for our client. What illnesses they may have, what pathologies, what surgeries, as we never work in isolation. So hopefully understanding how the cells of the body from that smallest basic unit multiply up and go through that hierarchy to create the human body itself gives you a better understanding as to why screening is so important and why also understanding what actually happens when we touch a client's body is also really key to achieving the results you want for your client.